over the past year, I've spent countless hours attempting to understand the conflict of historical feminism and modern day gender ideology. As part of my homework, I've interviewed numerous feminists, journalists, and academics that believe that the word woman is defined by biology versus a stated identity, and that any change in that canonical definition is harmful to the needed categorization and protection of women at large. And in my attempt to better understand gender ideology, I've interviewed numerous members of our trans community, as well as the many activists and liberal progressives who believe in the immutable mantra that trans women are women. And therein lies the rub. Today, I will moderate our first True 30 debate with Julie Bindle and Brett Abney as my guests. During our time together, we attempt to find common ground on these two competing ideologies by asking the question, can feminism and gender ideology coexist? As you will soon hear, Bindle and Abney debate the historical meaning of words like feminism and the word woman and what it means to be a woman and a feminist today. Bindle is a story journalist and feminist who co-founded the law reform group Justice for Women and once served as the assistant director of the Research Center for Violence, Abuse, and Gender Relations at Leeds Metropolitan University in London. She is also the author of Feminism for Women, The Real Route to Liberation, a book published in 2021 to much international fanfare. Abney is an academic, activist, and progressive intellectual who passionately lobbies on behalf of our trans community here in America. My hope with bringing these two amazing people together was to prove that we are far more divided online than when we sit down in person. Yes, there are fundamental differences that may never reach a consensus, as we prove during this chat. But as you will hear and see for yourself, the power of polite conversation and intellectual dissent is our best way forward to achieve our needed compromise as a culture. I hope you learned as much as I did from these two wonderful people. Thanks for listening. All right. That's our legal warning that we are on camera and being recorded. So I want to first thank you guys for coming back on the show. You are my first repeat guests, as you both know, and some of my older um, subscribers know that you guys have both been on with me. And uh, so thanks again for coming on. And I consider you both friends who I have real disagreements with. <laughs> and yet here we are having some fun. And during my podcast with you, Britt, we discussed things like Dr. Jordan Peterson. And this was, you know, eight months ago before he kind of went off the rails even more. Um, we took discuss pronouns, whether or not speech is violence, which we disagreed about. We discussed Dave Chappelle, which we disagreed about, and a bitter gender ideology. And among other topics, um, you taught me a ton, Britt, as you always do when we engage in banter. So it's why I thought you'd be a wonderful guest to come back and represent a progressive uh, activist ideology specific to trans people. And Julie, during our time together on camera, we talked at length about your book, Feminism for Women, and your four decades long fight for women's liberation and gay rights, both as a feminist and a lesbian. And then we met up in New York, where you interviewed me on my uh, defund the police reporting. And we spent, I think, three hours at a little cafe getting to know each other. And uh, full disclosure, we've become very close friends. And you are now um, a contributing journalist to True 30 and on our editorial board. So all things full disclosure there. Um, just want to make sure everyone knows who who's here. And so we are basically the topic of the day is can feminism and trans ideology coexist? And so I just wanted to start out on that front and <clears throat> basically get into. And why don't we just start off with this one, Julie, is how do you define feminism why don't we start there i do think that there are hundreds thousands of ways to be a feminist but as i often say lightheartedly most of them are wrong so it would <laughs> appear that everybody thinks that they can define feminism as they wish even if it's pure anti-feminism that they're promoting so i think as someone with a stake in the movement in the actual collective movement that is feminism as opposed to it being an individual identity. I think that I do have an imperative and a responsibility, a duty to define it. And from that, of course, women, men can disagree with it and impose their own definition over that, what works for them. For me, it's quite simple. It's not about equality with men. It's about the liberation of women and girls as a sex class in relation to men and boys as a sex class. 
And it's about dismantling patriarchy so that women and girls can live truly free of oppressive structures. And those oppressive structures are prevalent in every single one of our institutions and embedded within our cultures. And I think it's really important that feminism defines itself as anti-biological determinist, which means apart from the fact that we state very clearly that women are not oppressed because we are a female sex class, but it's external forces, that we don't believe that any abusive, oppressive and violent behaviour in men and boys is innate. It's not inevitable and it's not embedded within anyone's DNA or psyche. Then it's actually a social construct versus a biological construct. Largely, although they do, there is obviously an interface. Um, there is a, a way in which the oppressive behaviors of men and boys under patriarchy um, are played out as sex stereotypes. Some people would call them gender roles. Okay. I would call them gender rules or sexism. Okay, cool. And so just to help my new listeners a bit, I've been reporting on the subject of gender ideology, trans ideology for about eight months. And I've interviewed clinicians, journalists, feminists like Julie. Um, and Julie has been kind enough to introduce me to other people like uh, Helen Joyce, who wrote a book called Trans when Ideology Meets Reality, Lucy Massoud, who is a LGD, LGBT activist and barrister in London, and I had her on the show. And so I mentioned these feminists because in my homework, I really didn't understand feminism, just being a, at exact most of my life and not paying attention to it. So it was a huge learning curve for me over the last eight months. And thank you again, Julie, for helping me uh, understand which books to read and what to understand best specific to feminism. And while doing all this homework, um, I've noticed this major divide between, I don't know what we call it, you know, historical feminism, first, second wing, whatever it may be, and then where we are today with progressive activism specific to trans. And Brit has been a buddy of mine for years, and we engage quite often uh, on Facebook and other social media platforms where we discuss these topics. And when I bring up historical feminism, that's where I want you kind of to talk a little bit, Britt, specifically. Where do you see trans ideology today? And then how is it differ from traditional feminism? How do you see that specifically to one of your first questions, which was, um, well, actually, I'll look, go ahead and answer that question first. Like, well, how Yeah, do you see sure. That? I'm going to answer that in, in reverse order just because I... One of the things I like to do when we're in discussions um, is to kind of start off with where we agree. Um, obviously, Julie and I disagree on a lot of things here today. That's why we're having this discussion, but that doesn't mean that we disagree on everything. Um, and I I would like to first say that, um, you know, kind of my understanding of definition uh, of feminism, I hate to say the way I define it, just the way that I have understood it based on feminist literature and feminist leaders um, is very similar to what Julie said. Uh, I think it's a liberation movement. I think that it is a fight to get women and girls out of oppressive systems and oppressive actions. The only small difference, perhaps a larger difference in her eyes, that I would say is it's not based on a sex class. I would say it's based on a gender class. So when we say liberating women and girls, I mean the gender women and girls. I do not mean specifically the biological sex. Obviously that includes biological women and girls, that it is not isolated to only biological women and girls. It is all women and all girls by their gender. Other than that, I would say my definition of feminism is identical to hers. Um, all right. Could you repeat the second part of the question there, Joey? Well, I just, and then specifically where trans ideology kind of, let's just say it's intersecting with yeah. feminism. And that's, that's kind of where we've gotten into it before. And I've actually referenced Julie and some of the other people I interviewed in saying that, hey, this is where feminism historically, and again, you've, you've talked about you know, second wave, third wave, there's new feminists, if you will, that disagree mm -hmm. with historical feminism on this front. And the bigger piece, I think, is the claim of trans women are women is not something that Julie and other feminists that I've interviewed agree on at the same level you do. So why don't we right. start there? Yeah. 
Yeah, so I, 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 I think you're right. I think that um, statistically speaking, there is a bit of a cultural divide where um, second wave feminists um, have a lot of disagreement as to whether or not trans women qualify as women, whereas third and fourth wave feminists are pretty much in universal agreement, perhaps not universal, but like 90 plus percent, that trans women are indeed women. Um, I wouldn't go so far as to say that second wave feminists um, all believe that trans women do not qualify. In fact, um, many have argued that one of the defining books of second wave feminism was Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex, came out in the late 1940s, I believe. Um, and a lot of people give credit uh, to that as one of, if not the books that started the second wave. And Simone de Beauvoir very much um, recognizes the difference between sex and gender. And she thinks that gender is a far more crucial aspect of what it means to be a woman than biological sex. So, you know, if, if one of the founding texts of second wave feminism sort of says that gender is is the more pertinent aspect of being a woman rather than sex, it's hard to say that second wave feminism is fully um, exclusionary of trans women. Um, but uh, certainly I do agree that there is more disagreement among second wave feminists than there seems to be among third and fourth who pretty much all accept, um, accept trans women as women. Um, and so, you know, there's there's this cultural divide where it's like if you came into feminism from like 19... 85, perhaps 1990 or later, you pretty much do accept trans women as women. If you came into feminism rather in the 60s, 70s, perhaps early 80s, um, it's less certain. You know, you could be a second wave feminist that is inclusionary. You could be a second wave feminist that is exclusionary. So um, I have a lot more to say about that, but that's my 30 seconds or less. Great. Right? No, that's great. So Julie? The most misinterpreted um, phrase within feminism. One of them is the Simone de Beauvoir phrase that you've just cited. Britt, I think it's one isn't made a woman, one becomes a woman, or one isn't born a woman. I mean, either way, you know, we're born babies. And, you know, biology matters. It matters about whether we are meant to procreate, not whether we do procreate. And obviously those physical differences between women and men. But what de Beauvoir meant at that stage was that gender is a social imposition on women and girls. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and whilst, you know, it's interesting what you say, Britt, and I think that, you know, there's much that we do agree on, where you say that gender is much more, I can't remember the word you use, maybe more strongly defining. It's more of a defining factor than sex. This is precisely what feminism wishes to change. So we don't want gender to be a defining aspect of our lives. We want sex to be as irrelevant as possible, apart from when it can't be. But we absolutely rail against the imposition of gender because gender for women, and this is what my feminism um how my feminism would explain it. And this isn't about waves, about first wave or second wave. It's about feminism built on material reality. We see gender as the way in which women are oppressed. We see sex as the difference between women and men in that quite obvious way. But we see gender as that kind of force that means we have sex stereotypes imposed on us, which is understood as femininity masculinity, in other words, sex stereotypes. So the idea that this is something that de Beauvoir said means that a man can morph into a woman and that that's the bit of social construction that she was explaining is, in my view, absolutely wrong. And in an ideal world, and what feminists like me strive for, is an end to gender so that the categories of male and female only matter when they absolutely have to matter yeah and, and and let me just say i i agree with that um to some extent uh i think you're right i think that a, a large goal of of many perhaps most feminists is to make um gender either irrelevant or certainly less relevant than it is in modern day um i think that's a noble goal i really do um, 
but I think we have to be realistic about the fact that gender roles are such a cemented aspect of our society that to make gender irrelevant is at best a long-term goal. It is not going to happen in the next few years or the next few decades. And so the, the question we rather have to ask is, what is defining for what it means to be a woman in modern day insofar as those things are cemented and promise to be continued to be cemented for the next several decades on the low end, perhaps much longer than that. So we're, we're in agreement that gender roles are a social construct that are largely damaging and should not be the case in many situations. But we also need to recognize that we're in a reality where gender roles are real, gender roles are imposed by society to such a degree that people have gender identities um, and those gender identities do not always match up with their biological sex. For sure. And, you know, you talk about long term goals. I'm, you know, I'm used to long term goals. I want to end <laughs> rape. <laughs> I want to end domestic abuse. You know, I want to end child sexual abuse. That's why feminists have to be the most optimistic social movement on the planet, because otherwise, <laughs> you know, we'd be going to, to bed weeping every night rather than every other night. And yeah. yes, you're absolutely right. I'm not suggesting that some gender identity doesn't become very hardwired. And in a sense, it's a little bit like sexual preference, identity or orientation. Scientists have been looking for a gay gene, a gene that would explain sexual preference, because, of course, you know, as a lesbian, I'm a tiny minority. People are always looking at why I am, why my tribe is, why we are gay men the same. And often they do the same with with child abusers, uh, they call them paedophiles and suggest that it's somehow a medical kink and they look for a gene to explain that. And so I'm very clear there is no gene if, if they were looking for a gene that have found a gene. And it's the same, I'm arguing, with gender identity. And I don't think you're saying anything different, Brit, but just to explain what I think gender is and how it becomes hardwired as opposed to it being innate, which is what many wedded to trans ideology will argue, is that it is something that we rely on. For women, I'd say that the gender roles that we are, um, that we're coerced into are harmful and damaging and negative in relation to those that men are coerced into, although I think many men do suffer with, with the gender ascribed to them. But what I mean by we get wedded to our gender is that many women know, we all know, that we will be punished if we don't adhere to a certain set of behaviours that matches our sex class. And I know we don't agree on the sex class thing, but we can get back to that, I'm sure. So femininity, you know, I've often felt more stigmatised. For example, happily choosing not to have children and talking and writing about it than I do these days in middle-class North London for being a lesbian. Because at least when lesbians have babies, they're real women. And that thing runs deep, even amongst the kind of left-wing liberal London intelligentsia in the media, wherever. Um, yeah. makeup, makeup and and feminine, you know, kind of signifiers, which I've always rejected, is scary to do that. It's, it, it is actually quite scary when you first do that. You don't fit. And so I think that many of us learn ways to stay safe or just liked, just being liked around men and around those that have more agency in the world than we do. And I think the same for men. If men drop, you know, their masculine front, I mean, they're going to get their heads kicked in by bigger, stronger men. So yeah, yeah. it matters. It matters. And sometimes, of course, those gender identities cross over what we're supposed to do. I mean, lesbians, uh, you know, there are many lesbians who identify themselves as butch lesbians and they have an entire kind of repertoire about that. And it's a very, very strong identity and they don't mean that they are men. They don't mean that they are trans men, but they're very, very attached to being not just lesbians, but butch lesbians, the same with some ultra feminine lesbians. So it's gender in my life and in my world. Gender has been subverted from day one, because to be a feminist and to be a lesbian, you're already gender nonconforming. Yeah, I hear that. And, and, and this might be a good time to slip this in, because, Joey, you're very polite in your introductions, but I think something that you, you might have left out here is that 
I, I consider myself a feminist um, and I consider myself an advocate of trans rights and trans equality. Um, but I'm an amateur. This is something that I simply take interest in in my free time. I do read yes. about it a lot. I think that I'm fairly well educated on it, but it is not my career. It is not something that I have devoted my entire life to. Julie, on the other hand, um, she, you know, she's something of a legend in the feminism world. If anyone has read pretty much any literature on feminism, Julie has probably come up, um, <laughs> and, you know, sometimes in contentious yeah. ways, but in an influential way, nonetheless. So I, I think that needs to be made clear here is that there's, there's a little bit of unevenness in our, in our perspectives here. And I, I happily concede that I'm coming at this from, from a less informed perspective. So I, I just think. Well, no, and that's, I, I should have prefaced this before we jumped on camera during my introduction. I do explain, you know, what you do for a living and that we're just friends and that you're a public intellectual for me. And the reason that I brought you on the show is because Julie and I have talked at length uh, privately about the progressive activists that she's gone up against, you know, at colleges yeah. and, and you are a representative of that only a polite one who is very cerebral in your approach to things. And that's why, you know, as I shared with you um, privately, this is our first debate at true 30. And part of what we're attempting to do at true 30 is live up to our mantra, which is understanding without agreement is the goal of our talks, of our conversations, of our debates. Yeah. If you will. And so that's yeah. why I thought you would be perfect because the engagement by enragement works. And we've talked about this privately as well. That's not the goal here. What we're trying to, what I'm trying to get across specifically to my listeners is where this ideology intersects and sometimes becomes contentious. And, and yeah. you, I think Julie already answered your first question, Britt, which was, you know, do you recognize the difference between sex and gender? Obviously she does based on that, that, uh, so we and how do you describe the differences? The one thing you have in here for another question, which I think is a good one, is Julie. This is Britt's question. Do you think the experience and title of being a woman should be isolated to only those that have faced sufficient discrimination and suffering due to their womanhood? And if so, how do you decide what is sufficient? If not, what would exclude trans women from being women? Yeah, and and maybe I can expand on that just to make it a little sure. bit clearer. Let, let's imagine a hypothetical, perhaps unrealistic biological woman who was born into a world surrounded by women um, and in a world that where sexism does not exist. Um, and she has never experienced any amount of discrimination due to her sex whatsoever. And then all of a sudden you pluck her up and drop her in our world. Does she qualify as a woman? If not, mm. why not? Okay. You know what, Britt, this is just the best question and I'm going to steal it from you. No, I promise I'm actually going to credit you. <laughs> it's brilliant. And I also want to just go back and say, look, how much I appreciate us having this conversation. Um, the fact that you're engaged in this topic and this issue and take the time to think about it is more than enough for you to be an expert in this because most people actually don't even critically engage with these issues. And that's why we're at the stalemate in my view where we are because we can't talk to each other. And yeah. I appreciate Joey bringing us together. So I want to just say that to you, thank you. Um, and also entering this discussion in, in such good faith. So the the question about the woman who is plucked from this universe where she has not experienced any sexism, male violence, abuse, and hasn't been, I suppose we could just say she hasn't been womaned. She, you know, she hasn't been done to, as I would argue that, that women are, is a fascinating one. And in fact, I've used that, I suppose I've used that an analogy in a different way. In my country, it's different from using it in the US. But I once heard um, a black British man in his 40s stand up at a meeting about racism, structural police racism, of which we have not quite as much as you do, but we have enough. And he was dead against introducing legislation that would specifically criminalize race, um, racial hatred um, in that way. And he used himself as an example and said, I'm a 44 year old black British man, and I have never experienced racism in my life. Okay, now, everyone gave him the benefit of the doubt, took him in good faith, and there were the, the room was mainly full 
of people of color, but said, good, we're really glad that that hasn't happened to you, but you can't use yourself as a litmus test. And therefore, you know, we can't legislate for the tiny minority. And it's not that we don't respect you, but but really, you know, th this is not this is not useful. And that wasn't to ascribe him false consciousness. Who knows whether he'd ever had racism as would be defined by other people of colour? Who knows? I, I certainly can't say. But when I talk to women, some sometimes very young women still in their teens or, or very elderly women who are resistant to the notion of women as a sex class, I will say to them, the one thing that unites women and girls globally, and there, there is only one thing I say, only one thing, is the threat and reality of male violence. And sometimes they'll say to me, that's that's ridiculous. How can you say that? In fact, Jordan Peterson, when I tweeted that in response to someone a while back, said this is, he more or less said, this is bat shit crazy. When I said that every woman on the planet has had this experience, the fear or the reality. And so I'll say, well, I'm really glad that nothing bad has happened to you. And then we'll carry on talking and I'll say so you've never been flashed at you, you you've never seen a an exp oh well yeah you know when I was on my way to school that time oh, okay so you've never felt uncomfortable with some bloke with some man at the water cooler sexually harassing oh god yeah him but he was just a jerk and anyway that's just banter <laughs> and as you go through it there's always four right. or five months, or even worse and I don't want that to be the case I do not relish that at all but the reason why I'm using that example to hopefully kind of answer your question is that I would do away with the category of woman and man in terms of keeping statistics, keeping count of who rapes who, who earns the least, who suffers sexual harassment, who has their children removed by the family court. I would, I would honestly get rid of it in a world where there was no structural oppression towards women and girls by men, because we are women and girls. So femicide, where women and girls are murdered, are killed because they are women and girls by men. So not because they got caught up in a raid in a bank and not because they were having a fight with an enemy, but because of their sex. And so to answer your question about if women hadn't had sufficient ill treatment, abuse, sexism, misogyny, because of their class is an impossible question to answer because our birthright is that mm -hmm. it is to be raised and it begins in the womb. It begins where we go along to the scan at the obstetrician and they start talking about how cute we look. And then they start looking at boys as fetuses and start talking about their weenie and how big it's going to be. And yeah. we have that from the beginning. So we can't possibly separate our sex class from the fact that we are women in this society. And once that is the case, once there is an end to male violence, abuse, oppression, and the like, I will, I've never known what it feels like to be a woman. I will stop using the word very, very happily. So of course, if a trans woman says to me, or a very camp gay man, both of whom I would argue are punished because they're too close to being women, or they're understood as being women, if they have their heads kicked in because of their perceived femininity or sex class as women, they are, quite frankly, my we are we are targeted by the same enemy. Misogyny is their enemy, and I will stand with them and in front of them because they have been perceived as what is so seen as so worthless and beneath masculinity, which is feminine. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and so, you know, I, <clears throat> the reason my, my question is two part is because it's exactly what you're getting at at the end there. I'm not asking if, you know, this woman who exists in this unrealistic hypothetical world, if she qualifies as a woman while existing in that world, what I'm asking is if she experiences 25, 30, 40 years in that world, and then is plucked up from that world and dropped in our world, where of course, she will face violence due to men. So now she is. It's just that she didn't for a very, very long period of her life. And it's no secret where I'm going with this. Where I'm going with this is imagine someone 
who is raised as a biological male, um, either due to pressures or because of a lack of self-introspection, didn't realize that they were a trans woman until later in life, say 25, 30, 40, and then becomes a trans woman, fully passes as a trans woman later in life, that person now will face violence from men um, in largely the same way, if not exactly the same way, as biological females. And so it's like, now they're facing the same discrimination. So are they are they less of a woman because they didn't have it in the early years, despite the fact that they're now facing the same discrimination now? Well, in my view, trans women are not women. Trans women are women. So th they can't be less of a woman because they are not women. And that doesn't mean that they don't come in for misogynistic abuse in the same way as some of my gay male friends who might be perceived as effeminate absolutely come in for some of that. They're perceived as, you know, you should be a girl. Um, really, you're a girl. Some are even mistaken for being girls. Some cross-dress, some might be drag queens. Um, some might experiment with traditional female clothing and, and the like. And so therefore, of course, they are perceived as being women and that, that abuse and that violence is horrific. And one thing I would say to you that makes a huge difference in terms of the way for example, I've experienced sexual violence and physical violence from men compared to my gay male friends, is the socialization as a girl. So from girlhood, we are told two things, expect it and then be blamed for it. Mm -hmm. It is your fault. And that socialization into that kind of stereotypical femininity means we feel extremely different about ourselves and are perceived as different when it comes to every single institution in the land. Now, that trans woman who all of a sudden finds themselves in a situation where they're targeted by misogyny, that that is misogyny. There's no two ways about it, but it doesn't make that trans woman a woman. We've had the socialization as girls and we all perceive violence and abuse differently. And I, and I recall listening to Rachel Dolezal, that horrific case of the woman masquerading as African-American, mm -hmm. um, who was perceived as black, who was perceived and therefore, of course, faced what you can only describe as racism because it was coming from racists to a person who they perceived to be black, but it made her no more black because she'd experienced that. What it possibly did, and this is hugely contentious, mm -hmm. and I'm not saying this is my view, but what it possibly could have done was give her more understanding and empathy about African-American people and how they face that violence. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that they are parallels in that sense. It, we, we also, a friend of mine uh, was assumed to be Jewish. She's not. She had what was her, her she listened to a horrific litany of anti-Semitic bile and told Jewish friends about it afterwards. And they were saying, oh, God, this is terrible. And this woman said, yeah, of course, it's, you know, were I Jewish, it would have I can't imagine how I would feel. Right. So, I, I mean, so maybe I'm misinterpreting you, but it sounds very strongly like you're saying that the hypothetical woman say she was you know a biological female all her life but was only plopped down into our world at age 25 that she is not in fact a woman in the same sense as you are because she was not raised with any of those things telling her that she will face it that it will be her fault she experienced none of that and 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 here's here's the rub and it's actually a great thing to imagine if feminists won if we had our way mm -hmm. if we overthrew patriarchy ended rape put a stop to the sex trade, all of the abuse that women face, and men and women live as we should, two halves of a whole planet, and actually lived in harmony and respect. That woman would exist, that woman who had had no abuse in 40 years. Mm -hmm. And therefore, she would be a woman, but she would be a woman in a very different world. And I, we wouldn't be having this conversation, because if she were in that world, so would men be. Right. And Therefore, there would be no abuse and we would all be pretty much kicking around happily, except for when you prang your neighbor's car or, you know. Right. A, 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 sort of, a sort of sex and gender Shangri-La. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I, I get it. And I, I agree with you that I think that if feminism, if feminism won, then a lot of these conversations would be pretty much pointless to have. What, what I'm a lot more interested in, though, is that, you know, if we somehow remove the battles of feminism for just a period of time, but then reintroduce them as to whether or not those individuals count as certain categories or not. Um, to, to me, I think that if someone faces misogyny, due to their womanhood or perceived womanhood, if they are mm-hmm. genuinely perceived as a woman and face misogyny because they're a woman in the eyes of their attacker, that's all it takes to be a woman. I don't think that it requires X years at the beginning of life of socialization to qualify as that. So I don't think that, unfortunately, in the world we live in, violence and abuse male violence and abuse or the threat of it is the only thing that connects women because we've all experienced that but it's not the only thing that makes us women right so clearly um i i'm an absolute anti-biological determinist i i don't even believe in maternal feelings i mean that's how hardcore i am yeah <laughs> i believe i believe that other women have them but if we are to define womanhood or being a woman by others experiencing similar to us, then we wouldn't be able to fight for our liberation as a sex class. Now, you and I disagree on this, but the reason why I'm saying it's so important is because otherwise we end up saying, okay, who's the strongest here? Who's got the most privilege? Who's white? Who's poor? And this is not what feminists do. We don't say that the Queen of England, oh God, she's dead, isn't she? Sorry. We we don't say <laughs> that. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I'm not laughing. <laughs> it's your, your response is what got me. <laughs> Imagine how terrible Christmas is going to be for us Brits with the King's speech. Yeah. This is going to be a low moment in my country, right? <laughs> because that man has got zero charisma. But anyway, <laughs> we're not talking about Meryl Streep deciding that she feels oppressed by a homeless black man. We're talking about like for like. And this is what we always do. We understand that there are huge power differentiations. But when we talk about sex class, we mean uh, women on par with men will be at a disadvantage at the very least. Yeah. And, you know, as, as as a feminist, as a grassroots feminist, I'm not interested in women earning a million dollars and complaining that their male counterpart earns one and a quarter million dollars. Clearly it's discrimination. I don't care about that because that's not a priority for me. My priority is we need to collect the stats. We need to do the work in looking at male pattern violence and how we actually challenge that, how we can actually empty our prisons by preventing the violence happening in the first place, how we can actually um, not d- have to deal with trauma because the trauma doesn't happen in the first place. So, so that that's my priority, and and I think that you know until that day, what we have to recognise is that we have structural inequality, and yeah. and I do think you know it's 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 on par with other structural inequalities where you can't just think about individuals against individuals. That's why that's why we we see ourselves uh, as a sex class. Well, you know, it's funny because I I. I, I keep coming back to this. I, I mostly agree with you. Um, I I certainly, if you want to, you could start dividing women up, whether you divide it by sex or gender. You could start dividing them up and talking about, you know, sort of the, the so-called privilege Olympics. You know, which ones of you are white? Which ones of you were born with wealth? Which ones of you were born into good neighborhoods? Which ones of you were born, you know, with higher education opportunities? You could do that. I don't think that, that is a productive conversation to have when discussing feminism. In other words, I think the only thing that matters for discussing who qualifies as those we are fighting for when we say that we're feminists is that they are women. And so I look at what are the things that connect all women across all race classes, all wealth classes, all any classes. And I think that one of the crucial things there is male violence and male subjugation against the person 
if they are perceived as a woman. In other words, if if ma- if the males of the world are violent against you and the males of the world oppress you because they perceive you as a woman, I don't see that as realistically different than if the males subjugate you and attack you because you were born biologically as a woman. Either way, you are suffering the same male subjugation for the same reasons. That is the thing that connects you as women, even if one of you is more privileged than the other. Okay, let me ask you this, Britt. Sorry, Julia. That's okay. Do, did you, there's a definition out there in the progressive ideology, specifically that if by self-decree you declare you're a woman, then you are yeah. a woman, right? Is, yeah. is that where you sit? Is so, so if anyone, anyone, myself included, if I just decide today I am going to identify as a woman, how does that then play in? What, what, how do you describe, maybe, how do you define the word woman then? I guess right. let's start there. Is that... So my, the short answer to that is no. Um, I don't agree with that. But there's a lot more to it. So I think that, I do think that there are things that make you a woman. And I don't think that just saying the words, I am a woman, is enough to qualify as that. Having said that, I think that it is a really good epistemic sign that the person is a woman, because I think that there's just not a high prevalence of fakers out there, right? In other words, if you said it, obviously it's a joke between you and me. Um, If Ben Shapiro said it, obviously it's Ben Shapiro purposefully trying to be hyperbolizing Mm -hmm. to make fun of the left. But you you don't actually go out into the world and find fakers that often. The overwhelming majority of people who are claiming they are women at absolute least sincerely believe they are. Their true gender identity is one of women. Their true experience in this world is one of being a woman. So when someone tells you, I am a woman, is that the qualifying factor that they're a woman? No. It is, is it a very good epistemic sign that they do genuinely experience what it means to be a woman in this world? Yes. And I think that for the most part, you know, absent extreme criteria, we should believe them. That's a great answer. And that's, I haven't heard that yet. So I appreciate that because that, for me, I have a hard time with, and by self-decree, if I say I'm a woman, that that means I'm a woman. And you say, then you, the follow-up obviously, and this gets really icky on the right where they make fun of this. And that's, that's, I think, unhelpful on all fronts. There has to be a definition. And so, Julie, same question to you. How do you define the word woman? You know, it's, we can't deviate from the biological reality of our sex. And for now, while we're in this mess with the prevalence of male violence and oppression all over the world to varying degrees, we have to stick to that. And the problem that I have with Brit's Kind of, and I understand that the kind of taking in good faith someone's seriously kind of held, genuinely believed gender identity, is how do we know what is a true trans person? What and what is someone who is someone who's masquerading? What where's the test for that? And I'll tell you what I mean by this because when we set up uh, in North America, in in the UK, and pretty much every other country in the world, when feminists set up women-only spaces and campaigned to have single-sex exemptions from certain jobs and certain um, physical spaces when we when we won our sex-based rights here in the UK, and to an extent the US, and that includes obviously a right to legal abortion as well as a right to women-only facilities if we present a rape um, relief shelter. We did that not because we thought that all men were rapists or dangerous, not because we thought most men were, but because we knew that enough men were in order to put us at risk. And trust me when I tell you, we're not shrinking violets as British feminists. You know, we don't think that we need to be protected from seeing a bit of gristle hanging between men's legs or, you know, sharing. Phys- we really don't. That That's not that's not our thing at all. But we work with enough women and their children who've been battered, who've been, um, you know, treated appallingly and blamed when they are raped and told that they really should just go home and forget about it so that we actually set up these facilities that would assist women in those circumstances. And it's made a huge difference. It means more women reported to the police. It means that more women had the courage to leave their violent partners who they feared would kill them. It's it's 
it's actually revolutionised the way that we think about male violence and women's response to it. And many men in those early days, and they still say it now, would just say, why can't we join your group, come into that refuge, um, use that drop-in centre, that hostel? That's not fair, because our facilities are often a bit nicer than men, because, you know, sometimes men aren't quite as clean and hygienic as women and all the rest of it. And by the way, I make no judgment here. I mean, look at Jerry's suit, for example. So hey, hey, I showered this week. You should be happy, okay? And you and you look as if you have. And I had a bath only last Friday, despite being a feminist. I'm going to actually shave under my arms at some stage. This is how hygienic I am. But anyway, how do we know when men said, oh, don't, you've upset me, you've offended me. I'm not a rapist. Well, we pretty much believed him you know we might have known him he seemed like a nice guy but how do we know and so unfortunately and this is the problem that the majority of men have and that trans women have because of that sizable minority of men that are abusive that are sexual predators that are repeat victimizers that we have to keep women protected from those sexual predators in extremely vulnerable situations such as prisons. And I've worked in prison reform for a long, long time. I've been in many women's prisons. I've been in some men's prisons. I want the majority of people who are in prison to not be in there. Only the most dangerous should be contained. But within prison, women in the UK have been subjected to sexual violence from trans identifying males. How do we know that they're true trans or fake trans people, because the pattern, the male pattern violence is exactly the same once a person has transitioned as it is um, for men who have not transitioned, who do not identify as female, ha haven't transitioned in, in, in any meaningful way at all. And, you know, how, yeah, of course, if, if some human beings that men perceive and treat as women um, are to be included into the category of women. What does that mean for weaker, younger uh, male prisoners who are raped repeatedly by older, stronger men in prison who refer to them as their bitch? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're certainly feminizing those young men. They're certainly um, treating them as a way that we, we women are all too used to being treated. Do we involve those young men in the category of woman, or do we say this is rooted in homophobia, misogyny, pure sadistic violence, and we need to address the root cause rather than decide we categorize every brutalized human being who may or may not be female as female? I'm not sure right. it's helpful. Yeah. So just on that, <laughs> on that, oh, go ahead, Brett. There's a lot of layers there. Um, so I, I'm going to try and try and kind of get to, to some of it. The, the first thing I want to say is that while while violence against gay men for being perceived as effeminate is terrible, and while violence against women, both trans women and biological women, is terrible, they're not similar. Um, sure, they might use similar slurs like bitch, as you pointed out, but violence against gay men, even perceived feminine men, is not similar to the violence of someone who is trying to rape a trans woman or rape a woman. So I, no, it's not simply that they're saying you're feminine and I'm attacking you. It's that it's when they are saying, I actually perceive you as a woman and I'm attacking you for womanhood, not for mere femininity. Um, so th that's where I think the difference is. On on women only spaces, this is, this is such a nuanced topic. So the first thing that I would like to say is that those are incredibly important. Um, they're severely underfunded and those are issues that we to address. When possible, I think that women-only spaces should be given the ability to separate some people in those spaces from other people in those spaces. And the reason I say that is many-fold. One is, let's say you have women-only spaces, and a trans woman is welcome in that particular space, and some women feel uncomfortable about that. That is a terrible thing. But I don't think that the answer there is to not let trans women in. I think that the answer there is to keep the trans women separate from the biological women whenever possible insofar as they feel uncomfortable. And the reason I say that is because even within a woman only space that only allows biological women, you could still have people feeling triggered and uncomfortable, right? Let's say a woman was raped by a man who had long hair 
and was about five foot nine and wore plaid t-shirts. And now you have a woman who was also raped come into that and she's got the same length hair. She's about five, nine, and she's a big fan of plaid. She is probably going to trigger that other woman. What are you going to say? You're not allowed in here. Of course not. You were both raped. You're both welcome in here. Now we're going to separate you if at all possible to avoid the emotional trauma, but you can't tell someone you're not welcome in here because you remind me of the person who assaulted me. We can't tell them that, hey, you're too close to what assaulted me. Therefore, you are not welcome when you yourself are a victim of the exact same kind of assault. That is not the solution. Okay, so you've just put forward an argument for the end of women only spaces. Whether you know it or not, you have because you've said two things. One is it's not fair or just to exclude trans women and we can we can come to that later but the other is by justification that a woman who is triggered by whether she's a big woman wearing plaid she looks like the female counterpart of her rapist it could well be that a woman is in that shelter who is actually very aggressive and you know that that's also an argument i've heard for why trans women shouldn't be excluded because there are some not very nice biological women in those spaces what do we do so the only solution the only common sense solution if we take your argument to its logical conclusion is to end women only spaces because having trans identified males because we can't tell who's true trans who's genuinely um living as um the opposite sex in every single way intents and purposes and will not use male privilege or male sexual aggression there's no way of knowing that. And as I say, pattern violence is the same with trans women and natal men. But if we were to go down the route of looking at who is triggered by other individuals, then we're going to have to have pods for each individual abused woman in case she's triggered by anything. I have never in my 40 years of working as a volunteer in shelters, as doing evaluations and newspaper reports on shelters of being surrounded by those that run massive um you know uh, non-profits for abused women i've never heard of an example where a woman is traumatized traumatized or triggered because she sees someone that could look like the female counterpart of her rapist the level of trauma in those shelters and in those crisis centers is beyond belief. The women have actually got their lives, their own lives to get back together and often to save. This is not a thing that happens. It really isn't. And, you know, the other thing is, you say, Britt, and I understand your point, you're absolutely right that homophobic violence against a perceived camp gay man isn't the same. They're not attacking them for being a woman. They're not mistaking them for a woman. You're absolutely right. I still think homophobia is rooted a lot in misogyny. But, you know, that doesn't matter. We don't have to argue. We don't have to agree on that. But when Rachel Dolezal was racially abused because she absolutely was understood mistaken for being African-American, why isn't she now allowed to still label herself and identify as African-American, if that's the criteria that you're choosing for trans women. Yeah, okay, so I'll work backwards there. Um, let me say, and this might come across as extreme, but you know, to some degree, it's it, it's a matter of frequency, right? So I, I believe her experience that she, she was racially abused in a way that was reflective of her abusers perceiving her as a certain race, right? If that individual experience that kind of racial abuse day in and day out for the rest of her life, I do think she should be able to identify as that race. Because I do think that that is one of the things that connects people of abused races, is that they are abused as a product of that race. So if you have an individual who is like, look, day in, day out, 10, 20, 30 years, I have been attacked for being perceived as Black, um, I have suffered the same things as black people because the world sees me as black. Yes, I do think that that person should be able to identify as black insofar as they also see themselves as black. Obviously, they don't 
have to if they don't want to. But if they see themselves as black because they share the same struggle, I do think that they should be able to qualify as that. Um, on on women only spaces, um, no, I I don't think that it, it the argument to its logical conclusion actually does say that women only spaces should be eliminated. And I also don't think that we should have to have individual pods for every single woman. I only think that separation should be invited between one um, abused person and another abused person when they say I am triggered, which as you mentioned, is simply not a particularly common occurrence. So luckily uh, we wouldn't have to involve separation to nearly the level of individual pods for people. Um, I'd also like to say that while I fully believe you that um, you have never personally seen a woman get triggered by uh, the traits of another woman. It's still possible. And I would also like to add that I have spoken um, many times with women who have unfortunately faced sexual abuse. And I don't mean sexual harassment. Um, I mean actual sexual abuse. And I have asked many, many women if they would feel comfortable with a trans woman um, in a similar space to them. Um, including a trans woman who perhaps looked somewhat like their attacker. And every single woman has told me, yes, I would feel comfortable with that. So I, I also think that the, the the possibility of someone being traumatized by a trans woman is there, but I think it's very, very low. That's, it. That's really interesting. And I don't think that we can ignore what we have seen as a widespread cultural phenomenon which is fear about particularly younger women and some younger men of saying I don't want to be in a changing room a hospital ward or a prison with a trans woman we can't ignore that we have seen whatever take we have on this debate and it's polarized and this is why we're having this conversation which I appreciate we know that there has been crippling fear amongst the liberal intelligentsia in particular. This is a class issue. This is not being debated in working class no. communities. No. You know, this is a very privileged debate. Um, and I have spoken to countless, countless young women and some young men who have told me they, they're not anti-trans, they're not transphobic, they have trans friends. They absolutely do not want to be in an enclosed space that should be female only with a trans woman, not because of transphobia, but because of male pattern offending. And in some, some, some of those women, you know, some of those women are religious, uh, very few of them, a handful of them I spoke to, um, are from different faith backgrounds where they would feel uncomfortable getting undressed, being in a particular space with men. Um, as a secularist, you know, I, I don't appreciate sex segregation but i've got to understand their position but the 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 level of fear that has been instilled in young middle class female students in particular is quite phenomenal they will say one thing publicly and again i'm not ascribing them a false consciousness i'm telling you what i have found and what's coming to the surface now in the uk what you lovingly call turf island they'll <laughs> say one thing uh, in public and then they will say another thing after that now in prisons the plaid shirt um i think i'm wearing a plaid shirt actually yes you are i am actually wearing a plaid shirt <laughs> i could be triggering someone <laughs> right now but the plaid shirt scenario um i don't i'm not suggesting of course i'm not suggesting that that couldn't happen but what do we do about that when women are traumatized and sharing a space that is a refuge away from men. And they're only in there because their lives have been threatened or because they've been through such a traumatic experience of sexual violence that they actually have to have specialist uh, trauma therapy and medical attention there and then. And so the fear and the uncomfortable feeling, and I'm taking it seriously, of that woman being triggered by someone that looks like her abuser is very different from the women in British prisons who have been sexually harassed and threatened by trans-identified males who are convicted sex offenders, and in several cases, and they self-identified as trans women post-offending, in several cases they had sexually assaulted children, when those women in prisons are 
pretty much all there as either a direct or indirect result of male violence in one way or another. And these women, and you say to me, Brit, and I appreciate what you mean, that if women are saying, look, I feel uncomfortable, I don't want to be with that person in this refuge, and we're back to plaid shirt woman again. Yeah, that's great. You know, we can all take her being triggered very seriously. Tell me what agency women in prison have to do that. With yeah. prison officers, you know, some of whom are actually sexual aggressors themselves, and we shouldn't have male prison officers in women's prisons. Trust me, I don't choose trans women to pick on. I've always said there should be no men in women's prisons. It's outrageous. How do those women who report their fear or even the sexual assaults from trans women, most trans women keep intact male genitalia in current years, Mm -hmm. And prison staff have already been trained by the likes of Stonewall, which is very, very pro-trans ideology, and other organisations that tell them trans women are women, and it's transphobic to say otherwise. Those prisoners, and I've interviewed several of these women who have been sexually assaulted and who've taken their cases to the Ministry of Justice Mm -hmm. and made statements, official statements, they have said that they, they had no space to report their fears before the sexual assaults happened to prison officers. They're trapped in the worst possible situation and many of them have been sexually assaulted and this should not have been allowed to happen. Yeah. Let me chime in here because one of the things, I'm going to wrap this one up because I, I want to get to the turf thing, which which is a nice piece, nice segue. But the one thing that I learned through many interviews with feminists uh, at Julie's level and statistical data is that rape centers, domestic violence centers, female prisons, the one common thread was not a flannel shirt or flannel shirt or plaid shirt was that they actually worked on not only keeping trans men out, but biological men, even on the janitorial staff, even on the actual um, counseling staff due to a baritone voice or due to anything that's traditionally male. However, that is, if it's constructed because it's gender, that's not even the issue. It's that men in general are removed from that situation for that exact purpose historically. So I think you guys did a great job on that. Um, thank you so much. Let's get to the turf piece, because that is a fun, fun thing, is that I don't like the term. <laughs> and I've always thought it was horrible. And Britt, you, as a guy that I look up to and respect, you've used that term with feminism. And you put it in your question to Julie is that do you think it's problematic that certain factions of feminism, i.e. TERFs, are commonly aligned with right-wing extremist groups? I think that talks a lot to the polarization of this discussion, and that's where we should probably dive in. Julie, just a time check. How much time do we have left for you? I've got 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Cool. So let's go on that specifically. Let's start there. Um, TERF, for those who don't know, is a trans-exclusionary radical feminist, which Julie has been called numerous times in writings and in person, uh, when she comes out of symposium, she's been attacked by trans men, or excuse me, trans women who call her a turf. Um, it's a big accusation thrown at J.K. Rowling, your friend, um, Kathleen Stock, Suzanne Moore. I mean, you name it. The, the it, Helen Joyce. All of the people that I've talked to uh, in this regard are being thrown that slur. So where does it come from? You know, why don't you tell me first, Britt? why you use that term and what do you think that term means and why do you think it's a yeah so i mean for, first of all i just want to start off and say if you just it's an acronym if you just yeah. look at the words it is not inherently pejorative radical feminist um, is, a, is a very old term that has been yeah. used self-identified by many many feminists not in an insulting way whatsoever so when you add the words trans exclusionary it's just describing a particular belief it means you are a radical feminist self-identified who does not think that trans women qualify as women. So it's certainly not inherently a pejorative. I would admit that it has been used as a pejorative by men. It was not intended as a pejorative by the individual who created or coined the term, and it is often not meant as a pejorative from those using it. Um, I say it because it's simply accurate to describe um, the class of people that don't consider trans women women. Now, what I would say is, while I do often say it, I don't usually mean it as a pejorative. Okay. Um, and if the individual whom I am speaking with says, hey, I don't like that title, stop using it with me, I will stop using it with that individual. 
Um, it's not inherently pejorative, but it can come across that way. So I leave it up to the individual. Okay. Okay. Julie, I know you've been, you know, called that it's, you know, obviously I've spent a lot of time with you over the last six months and it's a term thrown at you when you speak, it's when you be non-platformed, no, you know, no turfs, no Julie Bindles. Um, obviously your friends like JK and, and, and Lucy Masood and Helen Joyce and all the folks that I was fortunate enough to talk with, they, they do look at it as a pejorative term. And, and so what do you, what is your take on the term and what do you think it came from and what do you think it means? It's right. It was coined by a woman who did not spew hatred. Um, she had a particular ideological position. Um, she is not a trans woman from what I can remember from. I don't think so. No. Turf, that's right. Um, it is, it's an acronym, trans exclusionary radical feminist. And it is used, if you look at the website, turf is a slur, which has been collated by some feminists over the years. It is. It has become the ugliest word. Joey, I don't know how you are about um, expletives on your program. No, I, I, I swear all the time. You, you Americans, <laughs> you, you're, you're quite, you don't swear as much as we do. It's the new <laughs> cunt, right? It's the new cunt. Um, and yeah, I mean, obviously, some people will use it as a descriptor. Some feminist joke and have reclaimed it a bit and think it's funny. And th there's a, a city called Glasgow in Scotland where the word cunt is used as a term of affection or even just a comma, just a sentence break. Oh, he's a lovely wee cunt. How are you doing? Did you see that cunt over there? And no one... <laughs> In America, people would just fucking lose them. I know, I know. It's, it's a word here we don't say. It's a bit <laughs> off limits in America. It's much it more. It really is. British folk, yep. But they really do. In Glasgow, it's used as a sign of affection oh, or okay. just a comma. Uh, hey, that uh, cunt was. Um... Anyway, so of course, turf can be used in that way, but it, it it is a slur and it is a misogynistic one. What's interesting about it, though, is I mean, first of all, I, I don't call myself a radical feminist. I'm a feminist. The, the real kind, not the fun kind. Mm -hmm. And and I think that the, the term radical feminist has become so misunderstood, so misused, uh, and it's so Americanized that, you know, it, it doesn't really describe the feminism that most of us subscribe to that fight male violence. It, 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 it conjures up Michigan Music Festival, hanging your tampons on the fence and all the rest of it. But, you know, interestingly, I'm not trans exclusionary. I do not exclude trans people from my friendship circle, from the work that I do as a human rights activist, when I've been on Reclaim the Night Marches, which is a polite version of your take back the night, because, you know, we always sound a lot more polite, don't we? I've seen <laughs> on those marches, been delighted to see trans women. They didn't tell me they were trans women. They didn't pass very well as, as natal women. I recognise them as trans women. They were holding up placards, not saying kill turfs or suck my big trans dick, which I've seen on other marches, but they were holding up signs saying end rape, end male violence. And as far as I was concerned, and I would be today, they were my sisters on that march. It was as simple as that. I don't exclude trans people from my world. I would absolutely fight tooth and nail to exclude any men, and that includes trans women, um, because of the same pattern violence, as I've explained, from women-only spaces. And I will not have the word woman thrown back at me and colonised, and I will not have my sex identified by men when we know that there is um, a huge advantage to being raised male under patriarchy in the same way as I know I have an, a structural advantage to being raised white, as did Rachel Dolezal, which is why I personally, Brit, wouldn't actually include her, not that I have the right to either do so or not, but wouldn't include her in the category of black, because it, it's it's about that socialization, girlhood, whiteness growing up. And right. so, yeah, the, 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 the turf slur, it is a slur. It's become extremely misogynistic. But I'll tell you what's interesting about it. The worst misogynists in this fight, the very worst, are not trans people. I mean, there are one or two who've become absolutely vile, telling us all to die in a grease fire because we refuse to say trans women are women. But it's the actual men 
on the left in the main, and I am on the left, but men on the left, who have taken this war against women, as I see it, as an opportunity to practice and spout unbridled misogyny towards us. Because it's not cool if you're on the left to actually spout unbridled misogyny. You've got to dress it up in some way or other. And this has given those men the absolute perfect smokescreen by which to call us cunts, but they use the term turf instead. Yeah, I I, I, w- I will say um, a couple of things there. First, I, I, I will agree that the term is a little bit misleading when it says trans-exclusionary because it can be interpreted in the way that you've said it, right? Trans-exclusionary, like, oh, I exclude them from my life or I exclude them from the fight for equal rights. That's not what it means, and, and it could perhaps use another letter or two, I don't know. It, it means trans-exclusionary from the category of women, and it could be clearer in that sense. So I, I hear that. I, I recognize that complaint. It's valid. Um, I, I'm going to push back on the term being rooted in misogyny. Now, I want to be clear. Has it been hijacked by misogynists, such as you said on the left, and used in that way? Most likely. I've never personally seen it, but I fully believe you that it has been hijacked. It is, however, not rooted in misogyny. It was create coined by a woman, a biological woman. It, um, it was, you know, she was a feminist. It is primarily used by other feminists as part of their feminist movement um, to call a feminist term with feminist intentions invented by a feminist something rooted in misogyny uh, really rubs me the wrong way. Now, all things can be hijacked and used in a bad way, but to call it rooted in misogyny, I strongly disagree. Cool. Yeah, well, I, those I, I'm, are, I'm not going to argue with that. Those are great answers, and that helps a lot. I, I, This is the neat thing about conversation, is that I don't think if you talked on broadcast television with a progressive activist and a storied feminist, you would have this much love. So I really appreciate that on, your, on both of your fronts. The question then, and this is maybe kind of the next step specific to categorization and naming of things. So Julie was kind enough to introduce me to a young woman named Lucy Massoud, who is also a lesbian and an LGBT activist in Britain. And she shared with me during our conversation that during COVID, um, as a lesbian, she wanted on Hinge, the dating site, and she wanted to find a partner. And in that, they ask, give us three things about yourself so that we can match you up with someone and, and you guys can date. And Lucy said, and I'm paraphrasing, but she said some of the effect of, please do not be late. I do not like tardiness. Please do not make fun of me because Love Island is my favorite show, which you, Julie, said alone should disqualify her. <laughs> and please be a biological female. And that was it. And quickly, she was removed from the site, banned permanently for being transphobic and racist and using hate speech. And I bring that up because this is the kind of thing, as a left center liberal, that I think the ideology is pushed too far. And this is where the left gets a bad name. This is I just need to throw my own opinion in there first. What do you think of that, Britt? Specifically, do lesbians have penises? Because that's the big question around that. Because trans mm-hmm. women, historically and statistically, whether they're on hormones or not, or whether they are truly identifying as a trans woman, mm-hmm. they nor I don't know what the percentage is, but 98, 99% still have a penis. Okay. And they believe, and I have I interviewed a trans woman who was lesbian. And so what do we do with the naming conventions and the categories mm-hmm. of that specifically? Where where do you sit on that? Do lesbians have penises? And are lesbians being and gay men too, for that matter, mm-hmm. are they being bigots? because they request a a genitalia preference. Right. Okay, a lot of questions there. Um, <laughs> first part, do lesbians have penises? Um, they could. Sexuality and gender idea and gender identity are two different things. So you okay. could have a trans woman that still has a penis that right. is attracted to women. So they could. Um, naming conventions. Yes, they are confusing, especially for people who are not super dug into this topic. I am very dug into this topic and I still get confused sometimes. So it is confusing. There's a lot of work to be done there. Biological preferences. Completely okay. It's There's nothing wrong with someone saying, I prefer biological women, I prefer biological men. In fact, I push it way farther. I would say there's nothing wrong with saying, I prefer someone who isn't obese. I prefer a guy who is at least 
five foot nine or six foot. They do, I prefer, they do I, that. there's nothing yes. wrong with having sexual preferences. If you say, Hey, look, I only dig six foot guys, or I only dig girls who are below 130 pounds. That's your prerogative. Like you get to choose who you feel sexually attracted to. And there's nothing wrong with that. And by the way, have- you can't get kicked off for saying, and that's actually what Lucy said. You can say, I do not want black people. I do right. not want short people. I do not right. want fat people. Fine. It's all fine. Ha- but you having can't said say- that, Joey, yeah, okay. having said that, I looked into that story and I found an article that included commentary from the owners of the site. And that's not what happened. She did not get kicked off merely for saying, I prefer biological only women. What happened was that comment did piss some people off and it triggered people to investigate her. And the owners of the site found other highly transphobic views by that individual and kicked her off for that. It was not because of her mere preference in the dating site. And this, this is my problem. There are all these stories out there. Oh, I got fired for saying that men and women are different. I got kicked off a dating site just for having a sexual preference. And not every story has details recorded. A lot of them are just anecdotes. But every time the details are recorded, I have chased down these stories when I found them. And every single time, there's more to it there's more than, to- the, than the victimized individual lets on. A lot more. And so I am so skeptical of those stories when they're like, I got hated on just for this one phrase. Every time I look into those stories, it's like, bull. You completely exaggerated or flat out made stuff up. That's not what actually happened. So So I'm not saying everyone's a liar, but some of them are leaving stuff out. No, this is this is the problem with 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 Lucy Masood, who, you know, I did investigate the dating site and I saw all the messages and I saw the huge kerfuffle that it caused. And she was kicked off for her for saying that she would only date natal females. Because when they looked into her alleged transphobia, as you have, it's exactly the same. It's trans women are trans women. Lesbians do not have penises. This was the horrific transphobia that was supposedly behind all of the hate speech that culminated in her saying natal females only or whatever phrase she used. So what is being classed as transphobia is lesbians stating our boundaries. And as a lesbian growing up in the 70s, as a teenager being told all the time, all you need is a good fuck to straighten you out. What's wrong with a dick? How do you have sex when there's no dick involved? Trust me when I tell you, this is deeply, deeply offensive to lesbians to be told that some men with penises can categorise themselves as lesbians when we don't do dick. We actually have the right to set our sexual boundaries. And what this has done is it has attempted to destroy the sexual boundaries of young women. If young women want to have sex with a person with a penis, that's not my business. But by those men claiming to be lesbians and telling women like Lucy Masood that she is not fit for a lesbian dating site because some women have penises is deeply offensive. And if you have another view of that, then that's your view. But for lesbians, it could not be more offensive. Right. But there's two different things going on there, right? The, the, The one is to say to say that I only prefer people without a penis. Right. If you if you say I simply will not date anyone without a penis. That's completely fine. There's nothing wrong with that. She was not kicked off the site for that. The other is to say that if you have a penis, you cannot possibly qualify as a lesbian. Those are very different views. She but was it's kicked true. off. But it, well, it's the and you may believe that, that. and you right. may believe that, but but it is seen for like views, and I apologize if, if you don't want that title. Um, not seeing trans women as women is seen as deeply transphobic by many she was removed for that view not for stating dating preferences those are very different claims i know and and i and i agree that she was seen as deeply transphobic for setting her sexual boundaries and refusing no no no, not for setting sexual boundaries for stating that trans women don't trans women are women women. now she's publicly done that that numerous times that is right. a sexual boundary. Saying lesbians I, don't have penises is a sexual boundary. When you're not a lesbian, a, well, is. not not a sexual boundary in the sense of this is who I am sexually attracted to. This is who I will have sex with. It's not a sexual boundary in that sense. And and also, I mean, th- there should be no necessity to say 
people with penises when we know the biological reality is that only men have penises. And, you know, this is, we can argue about this till the cows come home because you believe that trans women are women, therefore some people with penises can identify as lesbians. And if lesbians say, we don't want to date that person with a penis, we're the ones transphobic. But lots of people recognize that this is flat earthism in the extreme and that we do have a right to say, we do not invite penises into our beds. And if trans women are women, then they have absolutely no requirement to tell anyone on a dating site that they have a penis. And this is how things happen. Like you end up in bed with a natal male, a lesbian who has got no idea that this person is a natal male. And that is, ex you talk about triggering, that is extremely traumatic. Yeah, but again, I, I really want to separate the difference between I have sexual preferences, I have sexual requirements, and you don't qualify as this thing. Those are not similar. You have every right to say, I don't want to sleep with a penis. And I fully support that. That's not transphobic in the slightest. But to suggest that trans women are not women can rationally be argued as transphobia. Now you bring up the aspect of, well, what if they sneak into your bed and you had no idea? But here's the thing. Transgenderism doesn't increase that risk. A biological man who identifies as a man could just as easily put on makeup, put on a wig, and pass as a female and sneak into your bed and trick you. That's not an issue with transgenderism in the slightest. That's an issue with dishonest people who have the ability to trick you. So do you think, just hypothetically, because we need to end on a good note, I think. <laughs> hypothetically, do you think that a penis on a trans woman, as you would understand that person, mm -hmm. the experience differently by a lesbian as a penis on a man who doesn't identify as a trans woman. Do you think that penis is different? Is the dynamic different? Is the yeah? Is I think that the, the, I think the individual's experience with a penis on their body is different depending on their gender identity. There are some similarities, but there are some differences too. So they're distinct. See, lesbians don't. Well, if you're sleeping with them, right? But they might if they are the trans woman. Obviously, you don't see them as different if they're, you're sleeping with them. That's why I keep coming back to you have every right to say, I don't want to sleep with a person for any criteria you want. You could say, I don't want to sleep with anyone with a mole on their cheek. That's fine. But there's a huge difference between saying, I won't sleep with that person, and that person does not qualify as a woman. Those are very different claims. The first is acceptable. The second is transphobic. So that's Clearly. the question, too, around transphobia. Clearly we disagree. But right. let's move on because I've got to go. I mean, <laughs> I've I've just told a lie to somebody about why I'm late. So let's <laughs> let's well, let's shift the topic because we're at deadlock on that. I've yeah, heard we are. Said, hopefully you've heard what, what I've said. Well, too. you could even you could take it to the next level. Is lesbian and gay men disappearing based on this? If you start to gender homophobe, like you say that homo gendered as opposed to lesbian or gay is, mm -hmm. is that taking the lesbian and gay? Is it, you, you mentioned earlier, Julie, that lesbians specifically the mention of lesbians, even in literature historically is being removed. So are, are lesbians and gay men being erased by this movement? Well, the word lesbian is used now about 35%. For, and this is just from a trawl over the last 10 years, increasingly in recent years um, on one of the big newspaper databases. It's used a lot less, queer, gay, the kind of all-encompassing, or lesbian and gay, almost all one word. Mm -hmm. Lesbian is, 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 as a term, pretty much, it's not disappearing, but it's definitely um, not as as used as it was and when I came out as a lesbian it was a horrible word it was difficult to get our heads around you know feeling pride in that word and I want to get that pride back and and there are there are again many young lesbians who are saying that they feel under pressure to refer to themselves as queer I think with gay men it's different gay men have always had the the word gay and you know I, I don't know if that is um changing or shifting but it seems to me that it's pretty stable i don't know many men that call themselves homosexual anymore put it that way so yeah queer queer is on the rise um as an all-encompassing but I, th I think it would be good to kind of clarify more generally i mean not in this discussion because unfortunately we don't have mm -hmm. the time but 
to clarify, I suppose, what a lesbian identity means, what pride in being a lesbian means, what pride in being a gay man actually means, as opposed to the kind of more ubiquitous or all-encompassing queer, which can and does, of course, include many heterosexual right. people. Mm -hmm. That was something that I, I've been researching on the on the the gay men side of things. I talked to a couple of my gay friends about this specifically for this conversation, and they said things like, queer is a, a very all-purpose word now that was actually a pejorative during their whole upbringing. And so oh, yeah. it actually brings back negative connotation for them because yeah, yeah. they say that was that's what kids called them when they were gay. You know, right. when I was growing up, right, I'm 56 years old. It was like when I was a kid, that was a pejorative term for a an effeminate boy or a gay boy or someone we. Oh, would God, it was a terrible with. word. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so the, the fact that queer came back in, in, in the LGBTQ piece is one of those things. But gay men have said the same thing, Britt, about this. And they are also accused of being transphobic. And that's mm -hmm. a weird thing that I didn't really pay attention to until Julie kind of made me aware of that. And Lucy made me aware of that is that it is you are punished for saying trans women are not women, period. Mm -hmm. That's just across the board. I've been called a transphobe because I don't believe trans women are women. Mm -hmm. I've interviewed tra 40 trans women and some do believe that. But others say I'm a trans woman because I'm in transition. And even on camera, I've had women admit that to me. And so I'm like, OK, well, do you get called a transphobe then? And they're like, yes, I do. Trans mm -hmm. women get called transphobes because they call themselves a trans woman. Mm -hmm. Gay men get called transphobe because on a dating site, they say, I want a man with a dick. Mm -hmm. Lesbians get called transphobe because they actually ask for a biological female. To me, that's where our, our, we're still divided as a culture. And it, it, to right. me, I, I don't know what the answer is there because historically, and I made this you know clear with Lucy when we, we talked, I said, his lesbians by definition are not fans of a penis. You're right. <laughs> They're just not. And it's not just the malehood of it. It's just so the fact that that is a piece where they would say, by the way, I just don't think trans women are women. That doesn't mean they're bad people. It doesn't mean they should be called slurs. It doesn't mean they should be removed from their jobs. It doesn't mean they should be doxxed. It's this is where our culture has gone crazy with this. And obviously you're not part of this, Brit, but that's for me where all of this discussion is so important. Because you guys obviously get along famously. There was no problem here. There's no name calling. But the disagreement still remains. Yeah. If you dis if you say trans women are not women, you are a transphobe and a bigot. And that is a brutal way to live for a culture, specifically to gay men and to lesbian women. And that I don't have an answer for. I mean, does that how does that resonate with you? Well, I, and, and I, I just I, I really want to drive home this point that it is perfectly acceptable to have sexual preferences, any sexual preferences. So if someone says a lesbian is a transphobe because she wants to sleep with people without penises, that person can fuck off. If someone says that a gay person is a transphobe because he prefers only other humans with penises, that person can fuck off. That's not transphobia. That is having sexual preferences, and that is 100% acceptable in all circumstances. That is a separate topic entirely as to whether or not we qualify trans women as women. They're, those are not similar. Okay, so let me ask you this. She, they went into, it wasn't the comment, and I looked at all the comments. Go. I've got to go. go. All right, well, you know what? Let, let me wrap up. I just want to up. say, um, I, I really wish, I know you're going to edit all the like duff bits out, but yeah, <laughs> I really want to thank you um, both for having this conversation, and why don't we carry on talking about this? Because we don't have to agree to come up with ways in which we can move this war out yeah. of the hostility and, and how we can actually end the war and just have a situation where there are those on this side that believe this, there are those on that side that believe that, but we can actually come together on the basis of need when yeah. we're being attacked, when we're trying to fight for a better world, where we want to make sure that Trump doesn't ever get the hell anywhere near the White House again, any of those really important issues, then we should be able to come together on that basis and do it respectfully. Yeah, I agree. And yeah, to, yeah. Add, to add to that, this has been great. And and Julie, we, we definitely do disagree on some things, but we agree on more than I expected. And, um, and, and, you know, I have immense respect for you on this topic. And I really, I really appreciate this conversation. Same to you, Britt. And of course, same to you, Joey, and speak soon.
Well, again, thank you guys so much. This is hopeful and encouraging because this is what our culture can get to if we have the patience and the fortitude. So thanks again, guys. Uh, I respect you both, and I will talk with you both off camera. Cheers.